Good morning and welcome to St Mary's Claverton for our live stream service. Welcome to regular members and welcome to any visitors this morning. On, my, on the screen is my mobile phone number. If you text by SMS a greeting to the rest of the church family, I'd be very pleased to read that out at the end of the service. And um, it's a good way, I think, we're finding of just remembering each other and keeping in touch with one another. Um, it's lovely to have some pictures of members of the church, so if you wouldn't mind taking a selfie or sending some other photo of yourself in, we would love to be able to show that for a couple of seconds um, in the kind of loop before the start of the service for people who tune in early to see um, one another. Sad news for us this week, on Thursday evening, um, Anne Hopkins Clark, a dearly loved member of the church family, went to be with the Lord Jesus. And uh, so our thoughts and prayers are with Joanna and the rest of the family. Um, and uh, we had our coffee morning on Wednesday morning that Joanna came to on Zoom so we could see and talk to her and we could hear Anne in the background as well just the day before she died. That was a, a lovely time the coffee morning and um, one or two extras joined us who hadn't previously which is great um, and so if you haven't yet tried Zoom do please give it a try. We're going to have another go as a coffee morning in two weeks time. Um, that is the uh, I thought I'd written down the date but I don't seem to have done. Um, so a week on Wednesday, that's the 27th of May. Uh, we normally, in when we meet in church, we would have a, an opportunity to give financially as the collection plate is passed around, our offering is received. Obviously we can't do that on the live stream, but um, there is the opportunity uh, to give by bank transfer and during the last hymn there'll be details or before the last hymn there'll be details up on the screen um, and a new way of giving is now become possible I'm very grateful to Ray our treasurer for lots of work with Kay the benefits administrator setting this up um, of giving by text so you would simply be able to text that number um, so the details will come up just before the last hymn if you want to use your mobile phone for that means um, you can be ready for that then. Psalm 32 verse 7 says you are my hiding place this is David talking to the Lord you will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance we are surrounded by a sense of trouble. I wonder how uh, you're feeling this morning in your home. Uh, but let's look to the Lord as our hiding place. And here is a song of deliverance, a hymn that praises God for his salvation. Praise to the holiest in the height.
Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we've received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. In our confession prayer, we're going to use as always in, with the Book of Common Prayer, the word miserable, which is not in the sense of to mean unhappy, but in need of mercy. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders, Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins, he pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him, which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his, ever, his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as, as it, it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, and, and ever shall be, world, world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Praise awaits you, our God, in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Saviour, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the waves, 
the roaring of the waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it, you enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Glory to the to Father, the Father and, and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is the Lord our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and as at the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have uh, two readings from the Bible. The first one now is from the prophet Isaiah and the words will be up on the screen as Harry reads to us but I'd still recommend finding it in your own Bible um, because we'll be looking a bit more closely at these words later on. Uh, to turn to to find Isaiah as I mentioned last week um, if you open the Bible roughly in the middle you'll probably find the Psalms. Turn right and Isaiah is quite a big book, so fairly easy to find um, just after the Psalms in the Old Testament. And here we go to Isaiah chapter 19. The first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 19, beginning to read from the first verse through to chapter 20, verse 6. A prophecy against Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother, neighbour against neighbour, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The Egyptians will lose heart and I will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The waters of the river will dry up, and the river bed will be parched and dry. The canals will stink, the streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither, 
also the plants along the Nile at the mouth of the river. Every sown field along the Nile will become parched, will blow away and be no more. The fishermen will groan and lament, all who cast hooks into the Nile. Those who throw nets on the water will pine away. Those who work with combed flax will despair. The weavers of fine linen will lose hope. The workers in cloth will be dejected, and all the wage earners will be sick at heart. The officials of Zoan are nothing but fools. The wise counsellors of Pharaoh give senseless advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise men, a disciple of the ancient kings? Where are your wise men now? Let them show you and make known what the Lord Almighty has planned against Egypt. The officials of Zion have become fools. The leaders of Memphis are deceived. The cornerstones of her peoples have led Egypt astray. The Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in all that she does, as a drunkard staggers around in his vomit. There is nothing Egypt can do, head or tail, palm branch or reed. In that day, the Egyptians will become weaklings. They will shudder with fear at the uplifted hand that the Lord Almighty raises against them. And the land of Judah will bring terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom Judah is mentioned will be terrified because of what the Lord Almighty is planning against them. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the City of the Sun. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a saviour and defender, and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings, they will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon king of Assyria came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, at that time the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos, he said to them, Take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped and barefoot. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away, stripped and barefoot, the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared, to Egypt's shame. Those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. In that day, the people who live on this coast will say, See what has happened to those we relied on, those we fled to for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. How then can we escape? 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. We praise we Thee, O God. God. We acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. Lord. All we the earth doth worship, worship Thee, the Father everlasting. To Thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To Thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of Thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise Thee, the goodly fellowship of the prophets praise Thee, the noble army of martyrs praise Thee, the Holy Church throughout all the world doth acknowledge Thee, the Father of an infinite majesty, Thine honourable, true and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ, Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When Thou tookest upon Thee to deliver man, Thou didst not abhor the virgin's womb. When Thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, Thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that Thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray Thee, help Thy servants, whom Thou hast redeemed with Thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with Thy saints in glory everlasting. Our second reading this morning is from the first chapter of St Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning to read at the 15th verse through to verse 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. O oh, be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. O oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Stella Alford, very good to see you here. And first day today that you've been on Zoom, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. And, yes. Um, it was great to have you join us for the coffee morning this morning. So we're, we're doing this on Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. And so uh, how did you manage to get onto Zoom for coffee? Yeah, well, I followed um, uh, Hugh's um, excellent advice. And I managed to get there. Um, hadn't realised I was on video. I thought I was on audio only. So um, <laughs> picture wasn't quite um, as good as that. Um, obviously it should have been. But, you uh, looked fine, but we just had more of a thing with the light coming from behind. So half your face was in shadow, but you're really beautifully lit now. <laughs> um, well, I brought it so, downstairs. So and I'm sure all the St Mary's Church family are enjoying seeing your face <laughs> for the first time for quite a while. Um, and so uh, we're talking about recording a reading later as well, maybe for next week. Yeah. Um, but let me ask the same kind of questions that I asked Diane as well, um, as we're introducing one another on Zoom for the live stream services. How did you first get involved in life at St Mary's? Well, we moved here in 1977. And um, I first went to church, well, I went to church at St. Hugh's, which was the um, hut church at Claverton Down. Right. Um, when the Reverend De- Dennis Harvey was incumbent. And um, I went there because I um, used to go to church in Lark Hall, but it was a big church, which was totally alien to... Um, um, what I'd been used to, really. So um, that's uh, how I came to go to St Mary's. Um, so that was the 1980-something? Yes, it was. I can't remember when... Um, the, um, I'm not sure whether St Hugh's closed before the Reverend Dennis died or... Or what the other way around. Happened, or the other way around. And, but. Um, so anyone who's been at St Mary's uh, in the over the last few years, we'll, uh, we'll know you because you've um, been a, a regular part of church life there for, for many years. I wouldn't say that I was necessarily that regular down at St Mary's in the village because I did have a period when I don't think I came to church that much. And I think it was when possibly um, Reverend Paul, Paul Burton came back that I really started to come back regularly to St Mary's. Hmm. And how, how are you finding life under lockdown now? Well, I mean, I'm very lucky. I have a big garden, um, which I'm still capable of doing. I have a dog, which I walk every day. So I get out for an hour, quite easily can keep away from other people. And of course, I have my chickens to get me up in the morning. So, um, but um, yeah, it's beginning to get um, a bit tedious not being able to talk to people or meet people up close and I think that is um, getting more difficult but um, you know I'm very lucky. It's good good that you're counting your blessings um, in a difficult time and it's so I suppose as we look forward it's hard to see the way out it looks that's going to be quite a, a long time before things are, are back to normal or what we previously considered normal yeah can you think of one encouragement that you'd like to share with us well i think what i what i have worked out for myself is that i have a board in the kitchen and i make sure that the following day I have jobs up there that need to be done so that when I wake up in the morning I think yes I've got to get up because I've got those jobs to do and um, that means that I've got um, something I've got to get on and do 
and not just lays about in my dressing room. They have a sense of purpose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, thank you for that tip. And uh, we'll we'll carry on with the service now. And uh, so, uh, thank you, Stella. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let's pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people. And bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O Lord, from whom all good things do come, grant to us thy humble servants, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things that be good, and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same, through, Jesus, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, Lord, our, our Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, God who has safely, safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour to behold our most gracious sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue her plenteously with heavenly gifts, Grant her in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen her that she may vanquish and overcome all her enemies. And finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit. Enrich them with thy heavenly grace. Prosper them with all happiness and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O almighty God, who in thy wrath didst send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and also in the time of King David didst slay with the plague of pestilence three score and ten thousand, and yet Remembering thy mercy did save the rest. Have pity upon us miserable sinners, who now are visited with great sickness and mortality, that like as thou didst then accept of an atonement, and didst command the destroying angel to cease from punishing, so it may now please thee to withdraw from us this plague and grievous sickness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, at this time we want to give you great thanks for the life of our dear sister Anne Hopkins Clark. Thank you for her smile and her encouragement of the church family at St Mary's by her regular presence and support. Thank you for your mercy in the peaceful 
end of her life. Thank you that circumstances made it possible for Joanna to be with her to the end. And thank you for the hope that she had and the knowledge that she's gone now to be with the Lord Jesus. And we pray for your comfort and strength for all those who are grieving, for the wider family of Anne, as well as the church family, at a time when funeral services are so different and unnaturally distanced. We pray for your peace and presence and blessing on Anne's funeral when the time comes. And we thank you again, Father, for her life. We pray as well for our church life as we look forward from this crisis of lockdown with coronavirus and things are starting to change in the country's response to the virus, the lockdown looking to be eased up in various ways with different people feeling very different about safety, risk and the way forward. We pray for unity and not division, particularly in our church family in St Mary's. Please keep us united, help us to bear with one another where we have different <clears throat> attitudes, understandings and approaches and different health conditions. Please help us to be considerate of one another and to keep encouraging one another to keep in touch with one another and help us all to look together to the Lord Jesus and to you as our hiding place surround us with songs of deliverance in Jesus name we pray Amen, Amen. and as our Saviour taught us so we pray our oh, Father which, which art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy Amen. name thy Amen. kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Where do we place our hope in? On Christ, our cornerstone. So we sing together.
Let's pray. The Lord will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. Heavenly Father, respond to our pleas and heal us. Help us to learn from your word spoken so long ago and speak to our lives today that we might know your grace, your love, your healing and your hope. Amen. Should you and I be worried about China? I'm not going to give an opinion about that here, but just note the concerns that some people are raising about China's attitude to the virus that seems to have come from there, China's economic ascendancy, its military power and its technological brilliance combined with questionable regard for human rights by Western standards. So the nations that feel threatened by China, especially the United States, put pressure on smaller nations not to come under China's dominance and to resist the great power, not use Chinese companies to roll out mobile communication systems and so on. In Isaiah's day, the one to keep an eye on was Assyria. The expanding Assyrian power was a threat to everyone. Judah was on the front line once its northern neighbour Israel fell in 722 BC and was gobbled up by that evil empire. All the other small states in the region were looking around in fear. Would they be next? Now the historically dominant player in the south was Egypt, with the wealth of the fertile Nile and the military technology of horses and chariots, the Egyptians from their position of supremacy were getting twitchy about their northern count counterparts, those upstarts. E Egypt needed a buffer zone, so they worked hard diplomatically to try and get a resistance coalition going. Promises of funding and military support must have been full of allure for those small states. Last week we looked at the prophetic oracle about Babylon, God's word spoken through Isaiah in chapter 13. The people of Babylon probably never heard that message. It was given to the people of Judah to reassure them about God's power over their enemies. The same applies for the following oracles about Assyria, the Philistines, Moab and Damascus, the capital of Syria, or as it was in those days, Aram. Cush in chapter 18 is the sort of Ethiopia area and the lands you get to by going south up the Nile from Egypt. For a time, Egypt was ruled by Cushites. So the tall dark messengers in chapter 18 were the envoys coming to try and get King Hezekiah in Judah to sign up to an anti-Assyrian coalition. The extraordinary thing is that the Lord's message through Isaiah is not to trust them and yet it points forward to a day when they too will be included in God's people. Look at Isaiah 18 verse 7. At that time Gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. They will one day be worshipping the God of Israel. Trusting Egypt Entering into an alliance with them may seem attractive, but is doomed to fail. They will, the Egyptians, break their promises. They'll be like a walking stick that gives you splinters when you lean on it. Like a, a lifeboat doomed to sink. Don't get in that one. It feels like the only way to resist the all-powerful Assyrians but for the people of God, they need to trust God's promises and not 
human policies as their ultimate saviour. Will they trust God to deliver them from the enemy when they can't see how he could keep his promise to do so? Or will they compromise and go the safe looking way, join up with the best human alliance available? Isaiah takes many chapters to ram home the point that God's promises are the ones to trust. Here in chapter 19, the emphasis is on why not to trust the Egyptians as an alternative. That lifeboat has holes in it. Egypt is going down. So why, Judah, would you even consider binding yourself to Egypt? You don't want to go down under God's judgment with them. So let's have a look at Isaiah chapter 19 and see how its message fits with that aim and context. Egypt will become incapable of keeping its false promises to support Judah. For King Hezekiah to sign a treaty would be to sign Judah's own death warrant. What happens when God comes to Egypt? National morale weakens, verse 1, and religion ceases to steal people's nerve. The idols of Egypt tremble before him. There's judgment in this first half of the chapter seen in the structures of the country. Socially, there's a picture of conflict at every level, brother fighting against brother, neighbour against neighbour, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. In history, the kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt split again, having been united like Scotland and England. People's tendency to fight and divide is a sign of God's withdrawal of his blessing from them, leaving human nature to work out its worst. Pathetic superstition becomes dominant in consulting idols and spiritists in verse 3. And again, God's judgment is his withdrawal. As he hands the Egyptians over to themselves, they get the leader they deserve, a cruel dictator in verse 4. How much less in a democracy where often by God's mercy we get better leaders than we deserve, can we complain about the leaders we've chosen? So there's God's judgment seen through the social structures of the nation, also seen economically. Egypt is historically such a rich nation because despite the hot, dry climate, the River Nile, with its regular flooding, brought fertility to the soil all the way down from mid-Africa. Fishing with hooks and nets is depicted in ancient monuments as a prosperous industry, and farming with a wide network of irrigation channels brought not only abundant food but also the production of fine linen cloth. All of this, says God through Isaiah, will be hit by a serious downturn. And whether verse 5 means that the river Nile literally dries up, or whether it's as though the river might as well have dried up because the recession means it no longer brings its benefit economically, God brings Egypt to poverty. And politically, the advisers who are supposed to be a cast of wise men are fools. They lack any understanding of the Lord's plans and so are powerless to counteract them. Pharaoh staggers blindly to disgrace and ruin. It's like the, the Exodus plagues all over again. But this is by no means the whole story. The Lord judges, but he also heals. And sometimes he wounds in order to heal. Isaiah has given an insight into the, the distant future as well as the immediate. Just as we saw last week, this Old Testament prophet reveals a New Testament message. God's people will include not only Israel and Judah, but 
all nations, even Egypt. So focusing on the healing in the second half of chapter 19, this is seen in God's future blessing. There will come a time, says Isaiah, when God will bring reconciliation after all that division. The fear of the Lord, starting as terror in the face of his power, turns to fear and respect of the loving healer. Verse 19 describes the altar, which is the place of reconciliation, where people bring sacrifices together to the Lord. Deliverance or rescue in verses 20 to 22. Verse 20, he will send them a saviour and a defender and he will rescue them. Do you see here the Lord Jesus? In verse 21, he makes himself known to the Egyptians and they start to experience true religion, which is a response to God's revealed truth, not a blind searching for God. True religion brings people together and heals wounds between people. So there's unity. Even the two great enemies, Egypt and Assyria, are brought together with a highway connecting them and they will worship together. Who will they worship? the Lord, the God of Israel. Even more amazing is the way Egypt and Assyria become a threesome with Israel, blessed by God and bringing his blessing to all the earth. Isaiah foresees the fulfilment of God's promise to Abraham that all nations on earth would be blessed through his descendants. In Jesus, people all over the world, from every race and with every color of skin, come together as God's people. Isaiah saw all that in the future, which we can see it being fulfilled through the Lord Jesus who came hundreds of years after Isaiah, and it's being outworked now as the, the news of Jesus spreads throughout the world and we look forward to the day where it's complete. But then, Isaiah calls for understanding and our reading went on into chapter 20 which is very much part of Isaiah's message to Judah about Egypt. Egypt will lose to Assyria in the near term so don't look to Egypt for help is his message. Egypt needs to look to the Lord and one day will but in chapter 20 having shared this glorious glimpse of the heavenly future with all the nations worshipping God together, Isaiah comes back to earth with a bump and refocuses on the immediate future. The message for Judah at the end of the 8th century BC is clear. Don't trust Egypt. Isaiah had been acting this message out every day for three years, going around in the humiliating position of it's not quite clear whether it's being completely naked or something like wearing one of those hospital gowns that um, don't cover your buttocks. That's what enemies did to prisoners of war, expose them and humiliate them. And Isaiah warned the leaders of Judah that this is what would happen if they sided with Egypt. He stopped doing this embarrassing acting out that God had told him to do on the day that Ashdod fell because he knew the message had been fulfilled so when Judah heard the news they would get the point. Ashdod was a Philistine city that made the mistake of trying an Egyptian backed revolt against the Assyrians. The Assyrians defeated them and carted off the Egyptian soldiers in a defeat that foreshadowed the ultimate defeat of all Egypt 40 years later. How can you trust these humiliated losers, Isaiah says, before it happens? 
But now we're looking back nearly 3,000 years later. What about us today? Egyptians today can be very nice people, I'm sure, and as trustworthy as any other nations. That's not the point for us now. But there is a message to us today from Isaiah to trust God's promises and not rely on anything else and not bind ourselves into alliance with an approach that tries to save ourselves without God's help. The Egyptian spirit has been active throughout the modern world in trusting economic prosperity to get us through. We have solid military defence and we have money saved up for a rainy day like we're experiencing now and we have insurance policies so we don't need God. We have technological solutions to every problem so we don't need religion and then we're humbled. Coronavirus, like a bolt from the blue, undercuts all the security and makes us unsure of so much we thought we were sure of. Maybe other problems do this to us as well. Anxiety or depression, physical illness, accidents, financial misfortune, family troubles, could all be, in a way that at first is hard for us to understand, gifts from God to bring us to recognise our need of his help. If we feel the rug has been pulled from under our feet, how will we respond? We could scramble to get back to feeling confident, making money, sorting out our health and fitness and avoid the big questions of life as we sort ourselves out and try and get back to how we were before, like making an alliance with Egypt. Even if we never had those things but we pin our hopes on getting them, we make the mistake Judah was being warned against. Or we could turn to God and desperately ask for his help trust that he keeps his promises and rely on him to keep us safe in his hand to give us what we need and rest in his loving care our final hymn uh, comes uh, with the opportunity to um, to give as we normally would in church. There are the bank details which are unchanged, so you may already have a note of those. The new information, the new opportunity to give by text is simply to send an SMS message to the number 70460. And the message that you send depends on how much you'd like to give. It needs to be one of these preset amounts. There's no rule against doing it multiple times, uh, but, um, as you can see, there is a fee, but it, with gift aid as well, it's a reasonably efficient way of giving. Uh, and so we're very grateful for gifts received by any means. And the hymn we're going to sing is one that uh, is a new hymn written in the last 20 years or so. And it quickly became very popular throughout this country and became sort of top of the songs of praise charts. In Christ alone, my hope is found. There's no point hoping like uh, hoping in Egypt to defend against Assyria. There's no point hoping in anything else. In Christ alone, our hope is found.
do send in a text now if you'd like uh, to greet the rest of the church family. I've had a, a couple just come in now. Um, sorry, my phone switched itself off. Here we are. Hugh Corns, greetings to everyone. I had my 23rd birthday on Friday and had a lovely day of celebrations. Um, well done, Hugh, in lockdown. Love to you all, Hugh, he says. Uh, and um, another message from Stella. Now I know why my late husband said my voice sounded like a grating Hampshire gate. I can't believe he said that, Stella. I thought your voice sounded good. And um, thank you very much for doing that uh, interview, which is, I think, a lovely way of um, keeping, you know, seeing each other in the, the church family. So um, if others would like to, to do that as well, do let me know and we'll have more of those. Um, Greetings to all and thank you so much for prayers for my mother and lovely interview Stella, love Joanna. Um, thanks Joanna, good that you're able to be with us again this week and so glad that you've been around for the last few weeks. Well, I think that's all uh, text wise. Um, so just giving a last chance in case someone sent one in the last half minute because of the delay. Um, now uh, let's have a prayer of blessing and then um, why not phone somebody else from the church family and just uh, see how they're doing and say hello and share God's peace with them. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.